Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. As far as we know, the ancient Mesopotamian epic of Gilgamesh is the world's oldest story. I taught Gilgamesh for five years in 10th grade classrooms at a public high school in Missouri. I always loved it, and I never really tired of teaching it, even after reading it three or four times per day for a few weeks on end for five consecutive Novembers. In this ultimate buddy saga, Gilgamesh, who is a king and not a very nice person, befriends his doppelganger, Enkidu. Together, they go on an adventurous tear through the wilderness, slay a beast in an enchanted forest, but things go awry when Enkidu is killed near the start of the book, and Gilgamesh has to face loss, grief, pain, and suffering for really the first time in his life. He goes on a quest for immortality in order to bring his friend back, and he learns a lot about himself and life along the way. The poem's timeless topics continue to resonate today. So today's topic of conversation is the Epic of Gilgamesh, and my guest is Dr. Stanley Lombardo, Professor Emeritus at the University of Kansas. Lombardo's CV is lengthy, and among his list of accomplishments are the impressive translated works of the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, and my personal favorite, his translation of the Tao Te Ching, which he did in collaboration with Stephen Addis from the University of Richmond. Lombardo is a founding member and guiding teacher at the Kansas Zen Center. He received Inca in 1992 and Dharma Transmission in 1998. Lombardo is an important scholar to my own teaching, my own high school classroom. My high school seniors uh, read his Addison Lombardo Tao Te Ching translation every year in my religious studies class, and he even participated in a Skype Q&A with my class over his work working with translations and classics. Lombardo has two brand new translations out, Gilgamesh and the Bhagavad Gita. Today's conversation is exclusively about Gilgamesh, but it's possible there will be a future follow-up episode on the Gita. In this episode, we talk at length about the challenges of translating ancient writing, the thrill of seeing the commonalities modern people share with ancient civilizations via the written word, and what Gilgamesh can teach people in 2019. So I am beyond thrilled to bring you this detail-packed conversation with Dr. Stanley Lombardo on the Epic of Gilgamesh. Dr. Stan Lombardo, thank you so much for coming on Classical Ideas. Yeah, my pleasure. So I'm curious if you can just go ahead and take a moment and introduce yourself to the audience, however you see fit. Well, my career has been uh, in classical literature, Greek and Latin literature. And uh, my publications are almost entirely uh, translations, verse translations of poetry mostly, although I've done a couple of dialogues of Plato. Um, But beginning with Homer's Iliad uh, and Odyssey, um, Hesiod's Theogony, the lyric poems of Sappho, the uh, kind of shamanic early pre-Socratic verse philosophers and Pedocles and uh, Parmenides. I'm trying to do this in chronological order. That's totally fine. That's totally fine. Take your time. (laughs) The, uh, The poems of Callimachus, the Hellenistic poet, hymns and epigrams and lyrics. Um, the didactic poem on the uh, constellations and weather signs by uh, Aratus, a contemporary uh, Callimachus. Uh, that about exhausts the Greek material that I've done. I don't think I'm leaving out anything. And then uh, Virgil's Aeneid, which is in many ways a sequel to both the Iliad and Odyssey of Homer. Ovid's Metamorphoses. More recently, the uh, Odes of Horus. And... Statius, uh, Achilleid, 
uh, which is a wonderful fragment of an epic about Achilles' childhood when he's raised by the centaur Carvin in a cave. Uh, and then most recently, um, these two books came out almost exactly the same time, the same week this March. And if you can see them both here. So we have the Epic of Gilgamesh came out at the same time as my translation of the Bhagavad Gita. Um, the uh, Bhagavad Gita, of course, is a Sanskrit um, philosophical poem, and Gilgamesh is the earliest epic uh, that exists in world literature, as far as we know. Uh, those are my translations, and that's pretty much been my life. I want to mention also I'm working on a collective translation with 45 other translators of the last great classical uh, epic, uh, the Dionysiaca, the life and times of the god Dionysus, um, of Nanus, of Panopolis in uh, northern Egypt, 4th century uh, AD, so some uh, maybe 1,200 years after uh, Homer. Uh, very long, very Baroque, very interesting, and I'm excited about that project as well. I'm one of the two curators of the project, and I'm translating some of it. So that's my career in a nutshell. Awesome. How did you come to be doing the Gilgamesh and the Bhagavad Gita translations at roughly the same time? Well, they didn't start at the same time. I had agreed to do the Bhagavad Gita, and I knew enough Sanskrit that I felt I was uh, able to get started uh, on that. And then I happened to be taken out to dinner by my editor uh, at Hackett, who for a long time had wanted me to do uh, Gilgamesh. And I kept complaining, I don't know the language. So he took me to a wonderful restaurant in Boston where Barack Obama had eaten. And so I confess that I recently had a dream. It was a Gilgamesh dream. And I heard a voice. And I should say that I don't translate anything until I actually hear a voice. I have to hear the poet's voice. It's not simply a text on a page. Just about everything I've translated was created for performance. Oh, I left out Dante's Divine Comedy. In oh, good. My list of translations, right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but that, too, was performative. We think of it as, as a text. Um, but it was uh, composed for performance, and so was uh, Gilgamesh. If we think of it as a text, we think of it as a cuneiform text. Uh, but it was originally a performative text. So I described this voice that I heard to my editor, Brian. I said, well, the closest I can say is that it sounded like an old Jewish guy at the bottom of a well. Because <laughs> it was a dream. <laughs> so, awesome. So it was at that dinner, and that was just a few years ago, and I said I just started on the Bhagavad Gita, that uh, I agreed, all right. And so uh, I learned enough of the language to get started. And so... I bought a copy of, uh, you know, the Teach Yourself series, the language series. Uh, this is Teach Yourself Complete Old Babylonian. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yes. <laughs> wonderful book, a wonderful language textbook. And I worked my way through it. Um, and then uh, I was very glad to see that there were uh, editions. Uh, there was one edition, anyway, of the Akkadian text uh, designed for students. Uh, all of the words were parsed at the end of the book and so forth. So that was a tremendous help. So I said, OK, uh, I can proceed with some integrity here. Although largely I relied on the magisterial edition and translation of Andrew George, who is uh, by far the uh, universal acknowledgement, the, uh, the dean of um, Akkadian translation, a wonderful scholar. So that's how I got started, and I committed to both of them, and so worked on them simultaneously, and they happened to be finished at the same time. Coincidence, really. Excellent. Well, I fell in love with Gilgamesh uh, fairly recently, in like 2013, uh, as I was teaching it in a 10th grade English class in the middle of Missouri. Um, I'm, so I'm curious how you first fell in love with the Gilgamesh and how you found the story and, um, you know, how it has, you know, uh, where, why you love it so much. Well, I do love it. Uh, not as much as Homer, say, or even Dante. I shouldn't say even Dante or Dante. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm, actually, uh, I began to really like it. I'm 
actually not in love with the poem, uh, when I started to work with it. That's when, okay, I'll confess to some degree of love. Not right. Good, <laughs> good. Okay. <laughs> but it's not something that has been dear to my heart for a long time. Uh, I would, uh, it's, you know, it's not taught much at university level. It's very popular in high schools. And I'm sure my publisher, Hackett, is relying on high school sales uh, more than anything. So I've never taught the Epic of Gilgamesh. Oh. And never taught it. Uh, and I uh, have only read it straight through from beginning to end uh, very recently in, uh, when I started to work on it in Andrew George's edition. And the reason is I found every translation I picked up to be wholly unsatisfactory. I just could not get through it, these translations. I have very high standards for translation, uh, you know, needless to say. Um, and uh, so I read about Gilgamesh and I knew about it, uh, but I, I really didn't fall in love with it. But when I started to work with uh, the text intimately, with uh, Andrew George's uh, Akkadian text and his uh, very, very meticulous prose uh, scholarly uh, translation, I began to see possibilities. Uh, my first efforts at actually translating were not very good. But then I really did start to hear the voice. And uh, that's when that's when it took off. And maybe that's when the love affair began. Excellent. Uh, how many translations would you say that you've read? I think that I'm up to about four at this point. I've read one. One, okay. That's my own. Okay, and so that, do you only have like one in your house? Uh, no, I actually, you know how you collect books <laughs> and I never read them. <laughs> yeah. Disappear. Um, uh, I looked and I have, um, uh, Sanders, George Sanders prose translation. Um, I have, um, David Ferry's, uh, verse translation. David Ferry is a considerable poet, uh, and, and translator. Um, but I, I didn't find it compelling, uh, enough to read through it. And it's only um, Andrew George's translation that I paid close attention to reading, working with it very, very carefully, actually. Excellent. Okay, well, I want to do a little bit of backstory for um, the audience as far as, like, the history of Gilgamesh goes. So, for a lot of people out there haven't read Gilgamesh. Uh, they may not have heard of it, or maybe they just haven't gotten to it yet for whatever reason. But what do you think is the most important detail for listeners to know about the discovery and translation process of the Gilgamesh cuneiform tablets? First, that they are cuneiform tablets. So cuneiform is not a language. It's a writing system. Uh, cuneiform is Latin for in the shape of a wedge. Cuneus is a wedge. So the tablets are written with little wedge-shaped styluses going in this way and that way uh, to form syllables. Uh, it's not an alphabetic sort of thing. It's, uh, it's syllabic. Um, the language itself is Semitic. Um, uh, you know, the language is sometimes called Old Babylonian, Babylonian, Assyrian, Akkadian. Uh, Akkadian is, uh, I suppose, the most common term now, so I'm just going to call it uh, Akkadian. Um, it's West, um, I'm sorry, it's Eastern Semitic. The Western Semitic languages include Hebrew and Arabic. And when these tablets were first discovered, uh, in the middle of the 1800s, uh, no one knew how to read them. Cuneiform had been completely lost to human civilization for 1,700 years. Uh, the last evidence we have of cuneiform uh, tablets uh, existing would be the first century uh, of the Common Era. And then, you know, classical antiquity, Greek and Roman uh, uh, Culture and literature simply swept all that away. Um, of course, the Arabic and Hebrew texts, uh, you know, especially Hebrew, uh, which is, um, you know, the Bible is not as old uh, as, as Gilgamesh, but it's a closely related language. And it was only when uh, scholars trying to decipher the cuneiform uh, text uh, guessed, you know, shrewdly, oh, this is probably Semitic. So all Semitic languages work the same way, basically. You have roots composed of three consonants, and you have vowels that are infixed and prefixed and suffixed, and that's how the grammar works. And I had studied some Hebrew, so when I 
you know, set out to uh, learn uh, Akkadian. I, I had a head start because I knew the basic structure of the language. So the language was completely lost and the culture was completely lost, obliterated, uh, until discoveries made in the middle of the 1800s um, by French and uh, British archaeologists. Uh, in the beginning, there was really amateurs, uh, diplomats who were stationed in Iraq, noticed these mounds and poke around. <laughs> Before you know it, the Nineveh is excavated and the great library of Nineveh is excavated with thousands and thousands of these clay tablets. You know, and the library itself had burned in antiquity, but that only hardened the clay and made it more likely to survive. So nice. The library is burned mostly, the books get burned up. Here they get preserved, <laughs> which was interesting. Uh, so a, a tremendous scholarly uh, effort was uh, aided by uh, the discovery that uh, one of these tablets, which comes to be known as Tablet 11, contains the story of Noah and the Ark in detail that is very similar to what we find in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, this created quite a stir, uh, created funding and interest. Let's find out what this is all about. And um, all of this was very carefully studied. The scholarly consensus now is that the Hebrew Bible is drawing on an old Babylonian tradition and probably during the Babylonian uh, captivity or Babylonian exile uh, when Jerusalem was destroyed um, by the Babylonians and uh, there were mass deportations to Babylon um, for uh, that lasted almost a century. Uh, that's when probably, again, I'm just giving you likely scholarly consensus. It's yeah. still not anything certain. So that's the history uh, of the text. And then, you know, more tablets begin to be discovered uh, until we, uh, finally the has come to light. We're missing a few hundred lines still. So it's still a fragmentary text, but the beginning and ending are intact and some is missing from the middle here and there. So that's the history of the text. Are there any guesses about what is contained in the missing 550 or so lines of the story that are still missing? Well, I tried to do some conjecture myself. So my translation, uh, if you look at Andrew George's consummate scholarly edition, you have a lot of half lines and little gaps and pages that look like broken up text and, right. and so forth. Um, so in consultation with my uh, editor at uh, Hackett, you know, the publisher, uh, we decided we would present mostly a clean page. Um, wouldn't make up anything really, uh, conjecturing, oh, these 30 lines missing here must have been this and we'll just make it up. Nothing like, like that, but tying things together in small ways, indicating that there's a, a gap, uh, but making the, the page uh, more readable. Um, sometimes it's pretty clear what has been left out. For instance, um, we have um, when Enkidu, uh, Gilmesh's uh, best friend and perhaps lover, uh, dies, um, Gilgamesh goes through the palace uh, gathering up uh, all sorts of precious objects for the funeral. And then we have a gap. Well, it's more precious objects, and we don't know what they were. <laughs> so <laughs> it's pretty clear. <laughs> but sometimes we're not quite sure. Another uh, tablet um, that has um, quite a bit missing actually is the uh, uh, the fight in the Cedar Forest. Enkidu and Gilgamesh fight Humbaba, the, the terrible giant. And a lot of the battle is missing. But we know it's well more details of fighting and maybe this and maybe that. Um, so we pretty much know about what was missing. Nothing that's going to really add that much to our understanding of the story as a whole. Okay. So I'm curious about your um, translation process, but before we dive into that a little bit, I'm wondering if you can uh, talk about why it's important for the reader to consider that this language is lost for 1,700 years. Like when somebody in 2019 reads this story, um, why do you think that it's important for them to think about that this language and this writing system was lost for so long? What's the, what's the importance of that? It, it's a monumental moment in the history of our civilization, uh, actually, to rediscover a civilization that had been almost entirely lost. And, and it really was. Uh, you know, we, you hear of the Babylonians here and there, and mostly they're called the Babylonians. 
didn't hear anything about the Sumerians. Um, when these tablets were discovered, not only is this culture that we largely call Babylonian, I'm calling Akkadian mostly, uh, reconstituted for us. You have an entire human civilization that spans centuries that is now brought back to life. And preceding that civilization, the Babylonian civilization, were the Sumerians. All of this is located in the lower part of the Tigris-Euphrates uh, um, Valley, uh, southern Iraq, you might say. So the Sumerians were a completely different civilization. Um, they thrived from about 4,000 BC to 2,500 BC, and then the Babylonians you know, tend to edge them out and, and the civilizations merge. Sumerian is a language not related to any other known language. It's not at all like Babylonian, but it was a master culture. It was a little bit like Roman civilization informing the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, just all based on Latin literature, informing the Romance languages and scholarship and so forth. That's what the Sumerians were to the Babylonians. Uh, and they thought so much of Sumerian that among all of these clay tablets, we actually have grammars and dictionaries of Sumerian. And that's why we can read whatever Sumerian texts we have. Nice. It's astonishing. It yeah. Really I mean, because we're like in direct conversation with people who lived thousands of years ago. I mean, to me, that is absolutely miraculous whenever you consider that that conversation would not have been possible for almost 2,000 years. Yeah, that's exactly right. We're hearing their voices. Uh, and again, I think it is important to think of it not simply we're reading these clay tablets. By the way, most of the clay tablets are business records. 90% of them or more. Wow. Uh, government documents and business records and so forth. <laughs> this is true actually of Hittite also, which used cuneiform, although it's a completely unrelated uh, language. It's actually an Indo-European language. It's related to Greek, not to Sumerian, not to Akkadian. Um, but they use cuneiform. Uh, and their tablets too, oh, look, we've discovered this huge trove of tablets. This is so exciting. All government documents. All business records. There's no literature yeah. in the cuneiform <laughs> trove, but fortunately, there is here in the Akkadian and, and the Sumerian. Nice. Well, Stan, I found your work in uh, December of 2015 when I was going through many different translations of the Tao Te Ching that I was considering teaching to my seniors in high school back in Missouri. And I chose your translation of the Tao Te Ching with Steve Addis um, for a book to read in my classes. And you've collaborated with my class before. You Skyped in with us a couple times yes. to, to talk about your translation of the Tao Te Ching. Mm -hmm. And you actually signed my copy of the Tao Te Ching back in Lawrence. So thank you. Um, <laughs> so my students back in Missouri read your translation of the Tao Te Ching. And our favorite part of your Tao translation is the artwork and the translation guide in the back of the book. Yeah. <laughs> so like you included these unique characteristics in your Tao Te Ching to make your Addis Lombardo Tao stand out in my, in my view. So I'm curious with this Gilgamesh, uh, I'm curious what features and characteristics you offered um, in this Gilgamesh to the world that compelled you to spend the time to bring a new translation to fruition of a book that exists many times over? Like what kind of features and characteristics did you build in that you feel are special? Well, I did what I do with all my translations and I talked about this already this morning. I tried to hear the voice of this poet and I tried to bring it alive for a contemporary American audience. This does not mean that I've modernized it uh, in any way. There is a translation of the Epic of Gilgamesh by Stephen Mitchell, which he did during the Iraq War. Uh, he takes enormous liberties with the text, and he works in all sorts of allusions to the Iraqi War. Uh, I would have you know, none of that uh, at all. Uh, and he got very, the translation got very, we've got scathing reviews for what it did. So I'm trying to stay very close 
to the text that you know I'm able to read with the help of Andrew George and to the voice that as a poet uh, I hear. Uh, that's what it's all about for me. This was a living poet who actually delivered his lines to a living audience. Eventually it was written down. The Homeric poems are the same way. It was a completely oral tradition for centuries until it was finally written down. And I think that the Gilgamesh epic is the same, although we don't have the historical evidence that we have uh, for Homer and the Iliad uh, and the Odyssey. So I don't have uh, any special features. There's no artwork. Uh, there is a glossary so that you can look up proper names. <laughs> but, you know, that's routine. For uh, scholars who are interested in seeing what I did, I have an appendix that shows the exact line numbers in Andrew George's scholarly translation that correspond to the translation on the page. So scholars can see I'm not making up anything here. I am providing brief transitions between scenes that are separated by a small gap and just kind of knitting them together in a rather harmless, I hope, way. So there are no gimmicks here. There's no, there's no special features. Actually, I shouldn't use the term gimmick for what we did in the Tao Te Ching. I love the fact that at the bottom of each page, we gave a line in Chinese and the vocabulary in the back of the book so you could actually work out uh, your own translation. I don't know if any of your students did that. They did, yeah, and they loved it. And um, I've actually spoken about that characteristic of your Tao Te Ching on this show a fair number of times at this point a across my hundred plus episodes because the Tao Te Ching comes up in a lot of conversations and I always talk about how I like that you built that into that version so that people can engage with the text and kind of do their own thing and experiment with it a little bit. So you're asking me why did I take the time to do this besides, you know, I promised my publisher. Sure, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Once I get to work on it, once I had actually about the first eight lines, I felt that I was in contact with an ancient poet. And this you know, sounds a little mystical, and for me it is a little mystical. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel mm -hmm. somehow there's a mind-to-mind -mind transmission, very much uh, in the way that we speak of it uh, you know, in, in Zen practice, you know, from teacher to student. So as if I were the, the student you know, of this great poet, and you don't, we don't know when the text was actually orally composed. The best guess is about 1500 BC. The text that has come down to us was probably a living performance uh, 800 years before Homer lived. That's quite, you know, a distance. Wow. So that's what was driving me. Uh, I finally felt, okay, I'm really in touch with this material. I can really do it. I can be authentic and not just translating the words. One of the things that jumps out at me is the importance of dreams within the story of Gilgamesh. And you're talking about this mystical connection back to the ancient poet. Do you feel like the dream scenes uh, resonated a lot with you as the translator because yes, of this? They did very much. Um, so Enkidu has bad dreams. He dreams about the underworld. And it's not a very nice place and he doesn't want to go there. Gilgamesh uh, deliberately has dreams in his voyage to the Cedar Forest. So he and Enkidu build dream huts. And Gilgamesh sleeps in this hut, and then he wakes up, and this goes on like for five times. He wakes up in the morning, I had a dream. And he yeah, yeah. his dream, and the dream is guiding him. Where did these dreams come from? Are these the gods you know, visiting the hero? The gods care deeply. Uh, for Gilgamesh. So, you know, that's a fair uh, assumption. There's also a dream. Suppose you can call it a dream. I think one of your questions was, we uh, talk about the 11 tablets of the Epic of Gilgamesh, but yeah. we also talk about the 12 tablet Epic. What is that all about? <laughs> well, the 11 tablet uh, Epic has, um, is very, very complete. It's um, ending goes right back to its beginning. It's like this ring composition, the uh, opening lines which describe Uruk 
uh, the city or repeated almost verbatim by Gilgamesh as he's describing his city to the boatmen who transported him uh, back. Um, and so it ends beautifully. Enkidu is dead. Gilgamesh has been off on his quest for immortality, has found that it's unattainable. <laughs> he's accepted his fate. He goes back to his city, the city you know that he built. Then we have this other tablet. In this other tablet, it seems to be an Akkadian translation of a Sumerian original. Um, and we don't, we have some Sumerian models for parts of the epic uh, itself, but mostly we think that it's an Akkadian composition, originally an oral composition. But there's this 12th tablet translated from the Sumerian and it's kind of freestanding and sometimes tacked onto the 11th. In that tablet, Gilgamesh and Enkidu are together, and Gilgamesh says, oh, I've lost some things I really care about, and they're down in the underworld. Would you go retrieve them? <laughs> and speculation, I think it was a ball and a musical instrument or whatever, you know. Yeah. So Enkidu goes down, and he fools around too much, and he does things that he was told not to do, and he's trapped. But somehow this little portal it opens, and he can speak to Gilgamesh as if in a dream or as if he's a ghost. And he describes to Gilgamesh what the underworld uh, is like. And it's, it's a fascinating uh, you know, episode. And um, if we have a second edition of Gilgamesh, I think we'll say with an appendix containing the 12th tablet, you know, uh, because it would be fun to, to work on it. it you know, it's a plus. But yeah, dreams are you know, the, the spirit world speaking to us. I think that's pretty clear that that's, that's the cultural belief, you know, um, you know, for the Acadians. Excellent. Well, and you know, um, I earlier, I mentioned your collaboration that you did with Stephen Addis on the Tao Te Ching. So you're no stranger to collaboration and all of this scholarly work that you've done throughout your career is dependent upon collaborations. And you have this beautiful collaboration with Professor Gary Beckman from the University of Michigan, who contributes the introduction to the book and you acknowledge him as being massively helpful in the editing and revision process. Uh, what was the collaboration process like with Dr. Beckman on this Gilgamesh? It was very much like my collaboration process, say, with doing the Iliad and the Odyssey, when I worked with Sheila Murnahan at the University of Pennsylvania. She would read drafts and write corrections, suggestions in the margin and return them uh, to me. Uh, there were over a thousand such written suggestions for the Iliad and almost that many for the Odyssey. So it was quite, quite a labor and quite a contribution. It was the same process here. Uh, Gary Beckman would read my, my rough drafts. Um, sometimes, you know, you made a mistake here in, you know, with this uh, word, it's misconstruing this verb. It's, you know, some grammatical mistake I had made. Uh, reading, trying to read uh, the Acadian. So he would correct outright errors. There weren't that many outright errors. Uh, mostly he had suggestions for um, better wordings, uh, actually. Uh, and most of Murnahan's suggestions uh, were like that. For instance, or something that I had omitted, Utnapishtim, who is the Acadian Noah, uh, who built the ark that is very much like the ark that Noah built. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you know, as I said, this caused great excitement. So Utnapishtim's epithet is uh, a Akkadian word that means far away, distant. And sometimes it's translated as far away Utnapishtim. That sounded a little corny to me and without much dignity. So I translated it Utnapishtim, the distant, and distant is capitalized. And every now and then I would leave that out because the line didn't work with the extra two syllables or whatever. But Beckman said, rework this line. You've got to keep distant in there. Every time Wittnapishtim's name you know, comes up. So suggestions uh, like that. Um, and I would say, I don't forget how many pages it is, maybe 80 pages, maybe one or two per page. So that's substantial. Uh, you know, that's a real contribution. Uh, and, uh, and you're right, I, I always work with a scholarly uh, expert, even though I may be myself, you know, uh, very well uh, informed as a classic scholar myself. For instance, I did the Odes of Horace recently. I know Horace very well, but I worked with Anthony Corbeil, who's a real Horatian scholar, 
And that collaboration was very close also. Excellent. Well, it only enriches the experience and like helps you continue to be a lifelong learner yourself is what I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's the case. Uh, and again, minds come together and that's what it's all about. For it sure. Is. Well, in Beckman's introduction um, has a quote that I really liked um, that I'm curious if you can elaborate on. He says, a meter of Akkadian epic poetry is based upon patterns of syntactic units rather than of syllabic stress. So it cannot be rendered authentically into English verse. So how do you as a translator handle knowing a book cannot be 100% well, fully translated? And how do you proceed? I disagree with Gary Beckman there. All you have to do is repeat the syntactic patterns in English. And that's largely what I do. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. okay. And often, the, um, Beckman, I'm sure, would agree, he doesn't say so, as I remember in the introduction, that there's usually a midline break uh, in, uh, you know, in, in the Akkadian text. Uh, this is called a caesura, which simply means uh, a cutting. Uh, Greek verse and Latin verse work the same way. There's always dactylic examiner, the epic meter. There's a midline break. The, um, the meter that Beowulf is composed in, in you know, Anglo-Saxon, always has a midline break, and it tends to have uh, that same sort of syntactic parallelism that gives the swing uh, to the verse. So I imitate that uh, in English and felt puzzled. I you know, I'm doing, but I also have uh, actually the meter here is, if anything, based on the o old English Beowulf meter. You know, you have two beats on either side of the central break, and that's going to happen naturally in English, and actually it happens naturally in Akkadian also. You know, gotcha. Um, it's that it's a midline break. Okay. That. It holds the line together and gives it its rhythmic swing. Something else. Um, oh, yeah, go ahead. Richard also says, and maybe you were about to bring this up, it's composed in quatrains. Yes. Um, sometimes stanzas of six lines, sometimes two, but mostly uh, quatrains. And some translators uh, do that. I noticed that David Ferry's translation does it in couplets. Um, I tried quatrains at first, and I thought it's just breaking things up too much. I wanted a narrative flow. And so I compose in verse paragraphs, mostly, um, because it is a narrative. Uh, it's not a long lyric poem or something like that. Uh, the Bhagavad Gita is a philosophical poem, on which you can see it. Yeah. I definitely translated that into the stanzas, just like the original. Sure. Same number of syllables per line. I was very careful about it. So, you know, I'm perfectly able to do that when I think it's the right thing to do. But here, each stanza is a little philosophical nugget. It's not really narrative. It's teaching, 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 teaching. So I felt it's correct for the Bhagavad Gita. So, of course, it crossed my mind to do that with Gilgamesh because I was translating the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. To say, maybe I was tired of composing quatrains. I don't know. Possibly. <laughs> that was part of it. Yeah. But I want a narrative flow. I want to see this is a narrative poem. But I did use couplets and quatrains sometimes when we're not dealing with narrative, but with, say, ritual lament. So in Tablet 8, for instance, Gilgamesh is mourning for, uh, I can show you Tablet 8, maybe read a few lines of it. That would be great. Tell me what page you're on, because I have my book right here. Yeah, so Tablet 8 is um, page 53. And... Um, and the subtitle is uh, Enkidu's uh, Funeral. And maybe you can hold it up so people can see it's composed, uh, it's composed in couplets. Although I, I break into uh, some other verse form uh, after uh, two pages of this. And so, I th again, I think you can also hear in this, besides the fact that I'm composing it in, in couplets, this syntactic swing that is, um, Beckman is referring to. But first it begins with narrative. Dawn's first light was just brightening the sky when Gilgamesh began to lament his friend. O oh, Enkidu, a gazelle was your mother and your father a wild donkey. You were reared on the milk of wild asses and the beasts of the wild showed you the pastures. O oh, Enkidu, 
May the trails in the cedar forest never cease to mourn you by day and by night. May the elders thronging Uruk lament you. May the crowds who cheered for us mourn you. May the high hills and mountains mourn you. May the pastures mourn for you like your mother. May the cypress and cedar lament you. All the trees we wound through in our fury. May the bear, the hyena, the leopard and lion lament you. The wild bull, the deer, all the beasts of the forest. May the sacred river Ule mourn for you along whose banks we strode in our strength. May the unsullied Euphrates lament you, whose water we poured from skins and libation, and so forth they are in that mode. So that's ritual lament, and I thought the couplets, um, which are also in the original, worked well uh, in that instance. Thank you. That was fantastic. So one of the things I'm also curious about is the... Uh, description of setting, often at the expense of action description, which Beckman notes in the introduction. Um, this seems like it would maybe not fly in today's, uh, you know, modern <laughs> writing um, setting. But I wonder if it might make good cinematography, um, where you have these, uh, you know, long sequences of landscape changing so forth and setting mood and then the heroes swing into action you know? but but you're right and, and this is often uh the noted um i think it's a little bit overemphasized uh, actually by people who who do notice it um, there's actually quite a bit uh, of action um you know if you look at the, the you know the first canto um a lot is going on there. You know, there's a lot of motion. There's a lot of physicality. There's this wonderful wrestling match between uh, Enkidu uh, and Gilgamesh. There's Enkidu in the wild, just gallivanting uh, around like a wild animal. The, and Shamash, the harlot, seducing him. And, I mean, this is movie stuff. You yeah, know? Yes, it <laughs> is. Really uh, but then I could also see, yeah, you, you kind of pay homage to uh, all of the description, you know, that we find uh, as well. And the poet is clearly, uh, he's delighting, he's delighting in that. Yeah. And there's a lot of repetition, too, which I'm curious about, because in Tablet 1, there's three repetitions of the phrase, the beasts of the wild or reject him across yeah. uh, a couple of pages. Um is it tempting to remove repetition that you find in the original version to make it even a faster read? Or what's your stance on that? Okay, well, I first encountered this in the Iliad. The Iliad, too, has formulaic language. And these formulas are repeated endlessly. Uh, often it's uh, epithets. Uh, I, for instance, gave you polytropos dios odysseus. Instead of just saying Odysseus, he gets two epithets. And it fills up half the line of verse from that central caesura uh, to the end. This is such a strong poetic feature, I felt I should honor it. Uh, but just as you said, every now and then, when I wanted the action to be a little faster, I might leave out an epithet here and there. Um, but um, my decision here was, uh, whenever there's a repetition, I think, I think it's important, uh, actually, whether it's formulaic uh, language or repetition of an entire speech. You find Gilgamesh giving the same speech Describing how he and Enkidu got together. We teamed up together. We killed Humbaba, the bull of heaven. And it goes on for most of a page. And he delivers this speech three times to three different individuals. And it's exactly uh, the same. And you, you do find things like this. Uh, repeated speeches in the Homeric epic also. So it's, it's a feature of oral composition. And of memorization. Rather than you're just if you're just writing it out, you don't have these features. But when it's all in your mind, that speech is already in your mind, and it comes back. Uh, so we're dealing with oral composition here. Uh, I know there's a lot of emphasis on these the cuneiform texts, and that was it's an amazing archaeological discovery. And I think you asked me, have I ever actually had one in my hand? And no, I never have. <laughs> have you part, seen one? Country. <laughs> Pardon me? Have you been able to see a tablet ever? Uh, no, not, 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 not even to view a tablet ever, but firsthand. I've seen visuals, of course. 
Cool. Um, well, you know, and the repetition thing is also interesting because I see it in other texts. Like, for example, if you think about Julius Caesar by Shakespeare, it's for they are all, all honorable men, you know, and, and things are repeated. Yeah, yeah. And it's just a retention uh, method. Kind of a, it, it is rhetorical, uh, and it's a feature of oral composition and oral uh, delivery. And uh, ancient audiences seem to delight in it. Mm. You know, it yeah. says, oh, we heard this before. Oh, wonderful. I know what this is, you know, <laughs> sort of thing. Yeah. Well, you know, and I want to talk a little bit about the lessons of the book as well. Um, so my students and I would often talk about Gilgamesh's quest for immortality. Mm-hmm. And this really resonated with the students because humans are still very much on the quest through modern medicine, the extension of life expectancy, and the vigor with which we fight illness in our modern day world. Um, so that's one of the things that they really latched on to is this desire to live a long time, to protect our lives. Uh, what is something that you learned um, from the book over the course of your lifespan as well? Like, what are some of your most important lessons that you take away as a reader and as a fan of this book? Well, we begin with you know, a negative moral lesson. When we first meet Gilgamesh, he's filled with what the Greeks called hubris, which can be spelled H-Y-B-R-I-S or H-U-B-R-I-S, which is uh, excessive pride, arrogance, He's lording it over uh, his people. Uh, he has the right of sleeping with the bride on the first night of the marriage. Yeah. He's using them physically. So we see that. And we see that Gilgamesh learns not to be that way himself. So we are learning with the main character. And what has softened Gilgamesh, what has civilized him, you, you, you might say, made him more human, is his love affair with Enkidu. And it is often portrayed as a love affair. And you know, it's pointless to say, well, they were gay lovers or something. That, that cultural category simply doesn't apply. But they loved each other deeply. So his deep love uh, for Enkidu transformed him. He's now devoted to someone else rather than other people or only for him. And so the ideals of friendship and love, for me, came through uh, very, very strongly. And of course, culminating in Enkidu's death and the effect it had on Gilgamesh. It's in the second part of the poem that we have the fear of death dominating the ethical landscape. And of course, it's universal, uh, fear of death. It's not unique to our culture. Uh, It's good to see it, I think, uh, at the very heart of the earliest piece of literature that we have in human civilization. And this is probably uh, the earliest piece of literature that will ever be discovered. And so we are still the same. That's the lesson that came to me. You know, we have been human for a long time and we share a lot you know, with our ancestors, our distant uh, ancestors. That's what the lesson for me was. uh, And it was deep, too. For sure. And um, I'm so glad that finally my editor talked me into doing this. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and I used to ask my students as well to debate whether they thought Gilgamesh was a good leader. And you mentioned earlier that he would like sleep with the brides of people in his kingdom on their wedding night. And he was very arrogant and full of hubris in his life. But we do see that he's a dynamic character within the book, that he does learn that he's capable of change. Would you say that he turns out to be a good leader after all, in spite of his flaws early in the book? I don't think uh, he's in in a position of leadership. Uh, after uh, the first tablet. It's all about his relationship with Enkidu. The two of them help each other. Uh, Gilgamesh shows a lot of fear when they're traveling to the Cedar Forest, uh, and Enkidu has to encourage him. And during the the fight itself, which unfortunately is fragmentary uh, text. Uh, And so he's encouraging his comrade more than leading uh, his comrade. And the same thing with the Bull of Heaven, uh, now there, hubris is coming back into play. They have no business doing that, uh, really. 
Um, of course, Gilgamesh had no reason to insult Ishtar, who wants to, you know, make love to him. And it's a magnificent speech, uh, you know, that he delivers to her. I had a lot of fun doing it. He's giving her such a hard time. There's hubris coming back uh, a little. So he's still dealing with it. Uh, you know? uh, so it's a complex. Uh, it's not like it's uh, you know, a morality tale. Uh, so uh, it's, you know, one hesitates to, like, draw moral lessons from a text as complex uh, as this. Excellent. Well, um, why um, why do you think that everybody who hasn't read the Gilgamesh yet should check out the story? Well, this is what we've uh, been talking about. I think simply out of curiosity for what's the earliest piece of literature that the human race has produced and, and that has uh, survived. So there's that to start with. Then there's the deep humanity uh, in the poem. Um, and it is a narrative poem. It is uh, in verse. Uh, the relationship between uh, the two heroes and Gilgamesh's deeply human fear of death and the extent that he's uh, willing to go to to escape inevitable destiny. And then at the very end, realizing that it's his home that actually is his destiny. And his return home, the very end of the poem, which some people find dissatisfying because it echoes the opening lines, he's showing the boatman the city that he's built. And this is his home. So all of these heroic quests, they pale in comparison to the realization that there's nothing to be afraid of. We're always at home as human beings in this world. That's what came across for me. Well, Dr. Stanley Lombardo, I am deeply grateful to you for spending an hour with me today to talk about your new translation of the Epic of Gilgamesh, out now from Hackett. And also, I will be picking up your Bhagavad Gita translation, which I just found out about today. So, talk about that sometime. <laughs> absolutely. Maybe I will have you back on for a part two so we can do the Gita in detail because it's so worth discussing in and of itself. Um, Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's always good to spend time with you. Classical Ideas is produced by me, Greg Soden. Music on Classical Ideas is composed and performed by Derek Strybig. You can find his music at www.wearewarmmusic.com. If you like this show, please rate it on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can email me at classicalideas at outlook.com or find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash classicalideaspodcast. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>